it is sort of my duty to thank some of the sponsors and partners we have. Um, um, every year since we started, uh, Castle House and Contact have been big sponsors, thanks to Frank Conhouse and Ellen Castley. Um, we've had great support this year from the city of Durham in, in helping bring the fence back again. Um, Mary Duke Biddle Foundation uh, really helped us give out uh, three different pick grants this year. Uh, we've got some wonder, wonderful individual uh, sponsors. Um, we're blessed to be in an area that's got a handful of great museums and universities. And the way we're able to do as much programming with a small team and small budget is uh, they've all somehow drank some of the click Kool-Aid. And, and by that, I mean, um, we've convinced them all to sync some of their own programming uh, to produce photo-based uh, events um, in the month of October. And uh, on our website and on our newsletter, which I recommend signing up for, um, there are several more events going on. There are virtual exhibitions. There are a number of uh, virtual talks still coming up throughout the month. Um, we've got uh, great things happening with the Nasher Museum, the Ackland Museum, the Gregg Museum. There's some stuff at NCMA. Uh, we've got university partners. In fact, uh, the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University has two representatives here today. Um, in fact, I feel, I feel a little bad. Our, our moderator today, Michael Betts, started his new position there right at the beginning of lockdown. And I think this is the only way I've actually seen Michael uh, as most of the staff. Uh, he's come in when we can't all gather together. Um, so I know we're all looking forward to the day when we can do that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what other uh, shout outs I need to do. Um, um, what we're gonna do here is you guys are all welcome during the course of this panel to chat in the chat window. Um, but if you have specific questions you'd like to ask any of the panelists, uh, please send them to me via the Q&A button here on Zoom. And uh, I will be feeding that stuff to Michael throughout. Michael's got a lot on his plate today. He's got a big room and a robust conversation to manage. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear this. I can't thank these panelists enough. I think we've got a really tremendous group assembled. I think we've got just the range of, of, of folks, you know, people have been in this a long time, um, newcomer emerging folks who've got uh, documentary people, fine art, curators. I, I just think this is a really great group and I can't wait to hear this conversation and where it will go. Um, Michael, I think, I think I'm about to hand it off to you. Are you ready? My, my turn, my turn. <laughs> right, I'm gonna disappear uh, and, and come back if needed and uh let's get it going thank you Michael. all right thank you uh we just want to again start by saying a uh, special thanks to uh the click festival uh most notably uh bryce for in and i quote uh for not sleeping <laughs> bryce had no sleep he had completely sleepless nights for the last i don't know how long yeah. he has not eaten so we just want to say thank you for uh coordinating this lost um, 10 pounds <laughs> lost 10 pounds the, the, you, if you keep doing this, you're just going to be a little, little twig, little twig. <laughs> All right, y'all have fun. Thank you. Um, so uh, I am Michael Betts. I am the um, director for continuing to continue education at the Center for Doc Studies, as Bryce did mention. Um, and uh, I'm very, very honored to be joined today by eight phenomenal, amazing black artists um, all around our country. Uh, and so um, I don't want to spend too much time on myself. I want to get out the way so we can hear the, uh, the absolute wonderful conversation we're going to have today. So I'm going to start off by just introducing everybody. I got a small little two sentence shout out for folks, and then they're going to get an opportunity to talk a little bit more about themselves. Um, two things. Today is the beginning of a conversation. By no stretch of the imagination do we expect to cover everything. Uh, and the other part to this is you all, this is a family conversation. We have a discussion from black folks to black folks, all right? So say what is on your mind, what is on your heart, do not pull punches. Do not pull punches. I will say that one more time. Do not pull punches. 
we are here to have a real candid discussion. The reason it's called Photography While Black is because of, we all understand what that, where that comes from. We know what that's like. We've been in that space. So let's, let's talk about it. Let's be real about it. Um, with that, uh, also, I want to acknowledge, uh, you may be hearing some little thumps along the way. I am having my roof replaced today. So if you are looking for an amazing roofer <laughs> in the Durham-based area, I am the guy to talk to because they have been wonderful. They've been here for two days and they're almost done. So uh, without any further ado, um, I would love to start by introducing Chandra McCormick. Uh, she is a documentary, a documentary photographer that focuses on the environment, people, place, and time. She enjoys dealing with the beauty of community-centered issues for Black people and people of color. Also on the call today, we have Courtney Reed Eaton. Uh, she is a culture worker, creative engine, spouse, mother, and Black feminist. She is the current exhibitions director at the Center for Documentary Studies. Uh, she is also a visual artist rooted in documentary expression, striving for an emancipatory practice that upends white supremacy frameworks. Um, we also have Jessica Moss today. Jessica wears many hats as an artist, independent curator, arts worker uh, between Charlotte and Pittsburgh. Uh, regardless of the channel, everything she does, uh, her service, or everything she does is in service and support of her community. Um, we also have Kennedy Carter, who is an up and coming uh, Durham-based photographer. She's had her work seen all over, including in the New York Times just this past summer. Uh, we also have Keith Calhoun, who spent the last 40 years documenting the demise of black labor in the South uh, throughout the black belt. Uh, Calhoun believes in being keepers of the culture to hand it off to the next generation. Uh, we also are joined with Lou Jones. Lou is a commercial and fine arts photographer that has been working in the Boston and international areas, and I quote, for forever. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, Mark Clinton's. Uh, Mark is a NYC-based artist specializing in editorial, commercial, and documentary photography. His goal is to capture the Black experience in its, in its totality, the joy, the pain, and the triumph. Uh, Clinton is a Florida native and graduate of the University of South Florida and describes his work as whimsic whimsically defiant. Uh, and then last but certainly not least is Titus Brooks Higgins. Uh, he considers himself sometimes as an ethno portraitist, por portraitist, excuse me, uh, photographer who works uh, in related to growing up uh, in marginalized communities. Um, he creates portraits and photography uh, surrounding spiritual expressions of descendants of Africa throughout the world. Uh, and he most recently has had uh, his photos um, are about transgender communities in Cuba. So I would just want to say thank you so much. A special welcome to all of you. And I'm super excited to kick off the conversation. Y'all all, all want to unmute and you can say hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Fantastic. Hello. Fantastic. Well, uh, Chandra, can you do me a favor and just kind of talk, a, you know, in, I know it's going to be tight, but in three minutes or so, can you just share a little bit about your experience with uh, relation to photography? You know, I, um, I love photography. I, um, I think that um, photography has been something for me that, that has enabled me to express myself um, I love the idea of the type of work that I do and working with people and um, and just uh, communicating and having that rapport and building relationships. Uh, the type of work um, that I that I like to do, um, I, I have to I have to communicate and um, meet people. So I, I like the idea of, of making new friends, uh, finding uh, new things to work on in that aspect. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I'm going to quickly share uh, this piece from, um, from your, uh, uh, we are no longer considered. We no longer consider them damaged um, piece. Can you all see that? Is that coming yeah. through like it's supposed to? Fantastic. Can you can you kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of this work real briefly? So some of these, well, all of these works are uh, different themes that uh, we worked on uh, during our time, I guess 30 years or so before Hurricane Katrina. A lot of these works are color transparencies 
and black and white negatives. Um, they are the works of uh, cultural celebrations throughout New Orleans and Louisiana. Some are, uh, are uh, field workers, music and that sort. Um, the work was waterlogged and we decided not to get rid of everything. And so when we kept them in, and restored them, these are what we, what we came up with after, you know, having them in a freezer for more than um, five years. So a lot of them are totally abstract as what you see right here. Um, some of them you can visually see some of the imagery that was before, but these are mainly the abstract images and um, we thought it'd be a good idea to to work with them and now now that we see what they are you know we're very happy about that definitely thank you so much and uh again i know this is a i feel like i'm doing a disservice to y'all asking you to just run through introducing yourselves in such short manners uh courtney can you uh talk a little bit about your work and a little bit about you you are muted my friend Sorry, technology, not my friend. Um, <laughs> um, that work was so beautiful. I'm so glad that that's what you sent for Michael to share of your works, really beautiful. Um, so I, um, I started my formation as a documentary photographer sometime in the late 80s, maybe 1989, worked with a guy named Mel Rosenthal um, at Empire State College in New York where I'm from. And um, tumbling tumbleweed, work, 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 and ended up in Durham. I moved here in 1997, uh, knowing about the Center for Documentary Studies, having been an inaugural subscriber to Double Take Magazine, um, uh, had been interested in the work of Wendy Ewald uh, with children, and um, found an opportunity and jumped on it. And so in 2001, I became the exhibitions director at the Center for Documentary Studies. I'd had a small gallery in New York in my church. Um, I had curated exhibitions when I was uh, working with Mel at Empire State College. And so, um, and I also had a child. Um, so I, I have a son who's 35 and a daughter who's 26 and, uh, so I wasn't really prepared to, um, I wasn't prepared to be the kind of photographer that I imagined a <clears throat> photographer was, needed to stay closer to home. So made, made work about my family. Um, and over the years I've accumulated, that's my office that we're looking at right now. That's a detail of my office. So those are some of the books that I've accumulated over time. My house probably has, I don't know, maybe five times that many books. Um, and so over the last few years, I've started collaborating with some colleagues, uh, sister Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums and Shangodare Akinwale. And we have been talking about um, a project called Black Feminist Bookmobile. This is my sweatshirt. Um, and, and while the Black Feminist Bookmobile uh, is a project and is a thing, it is also us. I think that um, it's really important. One of the things that I've learned over an expanse of time, I uh, just had a 62nd birthday, very excited about that. But one of the things that I've learned over an expanse of time is that um, a lot of schools don't teach black photography. A lot of a lot of us that are coming up as photographers in development don't get to look at a lot of work by people that look like us and are photographing in our community. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry, my three minutes is up, but happy to talk about the bookmobile later. Anyway, I am not just making a black feminist bookmobile. I am a black feminist bookmobile. So hold that Wonderful. thought. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, Jessica. Can you give us a little bit of a brief intro uh, into your work and into who you are? 
Uh, sure. I, I just want to start by saying thank you to Click Festival and Bryce and Michael for hosting all of us today and to take a moment to uplift uh, this community that I'm sitting in my kitchen with this afternoon. Uh, so many people who are on this call, I think I, I respect your work. I celebrate you and I think it's a real honor to be able to be in community with you all today. So I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. I'm really honored to be here. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm Jessica. I have a really diverse background in the arts. I started off with a BFA in painting, uh, printmaking and drawing from Carnegie Mellon. And then I got my master's in arts administration, policy and management from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And then most recently in 2018, I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, um, the School of Law. And early in my academic career, even within predominantly white institutions, I really identified a need for safe spaces created for and by black people. Um, I saw myself as an active member in black student groups. I co-founded a weekly open discussion forum called the Black Lady Caucus. Um, I even served as the director of the Black Law Students uh, Association. But my work really is about reimagining new frameworks and strategies to build, maintain, and sustain Black spaces um, that are really devoted to the survival, resistance, and healing of Black people. Uh, as an artist, I'm so invested in creating these spaces and creating visibility for artists. Um, and rather than this idea of, of making a seat at someone else's table uh, or even uplift, like pulling more chairs to said table, I'm really into this concept of just building our own tables and creating our own spaces. Um, this work for me really stemmed from this project that I did in 2007, where I converted a dilapidated property in a historic black community and converted it into a creative community housing project for black artists and students. Um, since then, my work and my advocacy has really taken a number of legs. I find it with my curatorial practice, um, like exhibitions like 2018's Black Blooded, which brought 50 Black contemporary artists to Charlotte, North Carolina. Many of them had never even shown work or been to the state of North Carolina. Um, folks like Folks in the exhibition were like Martin Perrier, Carrie James Marshall, Nicolene Thomas. It was remarkable for the time and the space. Um, I also run a residency program in Charlotte, North Carolina called The Roll Up, which uh, supports a Black contemporary artist with housing, time, and money. It's anywhere from fifteen dollars to $30,000 to sustain their creative community engagement practice. Um, I've started scholarships that support Black female high school students who are committed to pursuing administrative careers in the arts. Um, I opened the Stony Island Arts Bank, which is an initiative of the Astro Gates in Greater Grand Crossing in Chicago. Um, I've been the program manager of the Black Artist Retreat, which is uh, a project by the Astros since 2014. Um, I've ser previously served as the creative director at the Harvey the Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and currently, uh, like Courtney, but maybe may different, I, I'm a new mom, and I have an 11 month old, and a lot of my work has, well, Max is making work now, which is a whole other thing, so I'm like managing my baby, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I started a project with an artist here in Pittsburgh named Alicia Wormsley, it's called Sybil Shrine, and it's an artist in residency program that specifically supports Black artist mothers in the Pittsburgh region, um, so yeah, I hope that's a uh, that's and perfect. That's Thank perfect. You. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you for being here. Kennedy, can you uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to the meeting? Hi. Um, yes. Can you guys hear me well? Got you. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Um, my name is Kennedy. I'm a photographer based in Durham, North Carolina. I've been making work for about five years. I started when I was in high school, and it's something that I ended up sticking with. Um, I, I try not to box myself in in regards to what I do, but um, I don't know. I feel like my work is kind of just all over in terms of subject matter, but um, really just lies in, like, I, I guess, Blackness and Black experiences um, as a whole and just what it's rooted in and what I'm most interested in. Um, 
and yeah, so um, I do a bit of fashion work. I do um, a bit of editorial commercial as well as I do some fine art and documentary work as well. And I really just shoot things that make me feel good. And that's pretty much what I do. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh -huh. um, Keith, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you yourself came to the medium? I'll go ahead and pull your... Uh, the, the virtual exhibition back up. Um, when I was young, I was able to um, migrate to Los Angeles to stay with my oldest, with my sister, who involved me in the arts, you know? She brought me around to the LA County Museum. She brought me to the Watch Writers Workshop. They had a lot of things going on and doing the movement. And I got engaged and started shooting events with some of the brothers at the Wise Writers Workshop and um, eventually it led to other things. And then eventually I decided to come back to Louisiana. And that's when I met Chandra 42 years ago. And we started um, getting involved in processing and printing and, and you know, just riding the back roads of Louisiana and, and realized that it was important that we went out, we didn't wait on no grants and, you know, like as black photographers, we have to do what we have to do out of our own pocket. So to meet someone like Chandra who shared my, we shared the same interest and passion and I think we was blessed to, to come together. And um, that's pretty much it. Um, so, uh, I'm, I do have up your, uh, that, that exhibition that Chandra talked about a little bit more or a little bit earlier. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more on any of the particular prints? Is there anything about this that stands out most notably to you? Like this particular piece is, uh, it's doing a, every Sunday in New Orleans, they usually a, 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 a social and pleasure parade. And these brothers was behind the parish prison. And at that time, they didn't. You could. They would pass the prison, and 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 the band would play, and the brothers would be in the windows, and they would, uh, you know, second line pay homage. Um, and the American flag was painted by the inmates at the prison on side the prison. So that that picture interested me like that moment. But that was, you know, in New Orleans, you know, every week, we, you know, we have something going on with music so right. this particular picture had a had a lot of movement in it right thank you so much for giving us a quick intro into you and uh i'm really excited to just have an opportunity to have you all on the call thank you so much thank you definitely definitely all right moving right along i'm trying to exit out and follow my notes <laughs> uh lou can you do me a favor and uh, tell us how you came to the medium. Tell us a little bit about yourself since you've been doing it for forever. Uh, <laughs> uh, you are muted, my friend. You are muted still. I appreciate the effort of, uh, that you guys have put into this and, uh, and including me. I have, like you said, forever. Uh, am I to show my screen or are you going to show your pictures of me? Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. You should have that that uh, okay. privilege. If you don't, Bryce, can you make sure that Lou has that privilege? How about that? Is it showing? That's perfect. We can see it. Beautiful. Okay. Um, I have been a commercial photographer for so long that uh, I think it's been I'm uh, been doing it longer than most of you have been alive. Um, this is the kind of uh, photograph that we do. This is FedEx. Uh, we work for Fortune 500 companies, advertising agencies, um, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, have been doing KLM and all kinds of projects. One of the things that became early on in order to distinguish uh, being a black photographer and having absolutely no opportunity whatsoever to come to compete in this, I had to start to specialize in problem solving for a lot of my clients. And there are a lot of commercial photographers say that, but 
I started doing things that were nobody else wanted to do, things that were too big, too small, too fast, too slow, became uh, very, very specialized in, in big productions and things and, uh, and have gone on. This is a current project uh, that's going on right now. Uh, I was on the set yesterday, on the site yesterday, photographing uh, a 60 story building. We're photographing unions and the workers making huge buildings right in the middle of downtown Boston. And it's like a, a big, huge uh, 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 project that, um, and that's been the core of the business, but I do lots of other things. I, I, I do, uh, is that over now? Can you, can you see me again? It's just you. Okay. Um, but I have published books, travel books like this. Uh, this went into several editions. How-to books like this, uh, Speed Lights. This has become a big part of the of giving back into the community. Uh, and then a few years ago, I did a, what we call long-term. This is a death row book, of, uh, 27 people on death rows all over the country. Um, took six years, long-term project. And currently, we're doing all the countries in Africa. This is the book that we just produced, uh, all 54 countries in Africa, and that's been ongoing. Uh, just last year, I put a push pin in my 60th country on assignment. Mm. And uh, uh, it has been a, a long, long effort to get to 60 countries, but We've been able to photograph for um, a number of clients, editorial, and uh, have been really, really, it's been a hard way for a black photographer to do it, but uh, it's been a really wonderful, wonderful. There's no better way to make a living than uh, being a photographer. Very good. Thank you so much, Lou. Very, very excited to have you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to the medium, my friend? Hello, everybody. Um, thank you again for having me a part of this panel. I'm inspired by each of you. Um, so it's very humbling to be here. Um, as I said, yeah, I'm Mark Clinton. I'm a Florida native. I currently reside in New York City. And I always say I've had a very long career in a very short amount of time. Um, I pick up the camera for the first time in 2016, um, just by nature of being on Instagram and taking photos of things happening in New York City. Um, and from there, it kind of grew uh, to taking on more editorial, commercial, and documentary work. Um, you know, I like to capture, as in my bio, like the totality of the Black experience, which means, which is like a good way of saying, I like shooting everything. Like I like shooting and photographing, you know, straight on portraits, editorial fashion, um, and, and documentary work. Um, so I use that phrase to just encompass all of the things that I'm interested in. Um, but that being said, you know, I worked, uh, I graduated college at the University of South Florida and I worked in tech for, you know, six years unfulfilled and, uh, and I discovered the art of photography on my iPhone. And from there I, I quit my job only a year after I started photography uh, to pursue it full time. Um, and from there, you know, it's kind of blossomed into its own life and I've been able to make uh, career of it and, you know, being continuously inspired by the people I meet uh, and photograph uh, day to day. Um, um, for me, you know, um, you know, I've had a transition from, you know, the corporate world to the art world has been, you know, a, a fulfilling and fun challenge, but I find that, you know, a lot of the experiences that I felt in the corporate world also relate to, you know, all types of dif different experiences that I've been having, you know, in the world of art. So um, it's interesting to, to really just tell the story and, and really get a good grip of the scope of what it means to be black, uh, specifically in America. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. We're super excited to have you. Um, and again, I, I always have to say last, but certainly not, not least is uh, Titus Brooks Higgins. Um, Titus, can you do me a favor and, and tell the world a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to the medium? That's fine. Uh, and I believe you've got whatever my couple of my images. Uh, first, let me just say thank you for inviting me to participate uh, in, in this forum. 
Uh, I think it's, it's really important, uh, not only for black photographers, but also for the art world in which all of us, you know, in through various ways, uh, live in and participate, participate in. As far as my photography uh, is concerned, um, I've been doing this for a little over, a little over 20 years. Uh, I've had, you know, other careers, uh, you know, before this. Uh, I was a political science major at Duke and uh, eventually wound up at University of Michigan where I did my MFA. Uh, I've taught at, uh, you know, some universities, taught history of photography and, uh, uh, you know, some theoretical courses of, about image, images in, in photography. Uh, as far as my work, uh, my work has somehow evolved into uh, uh, social justice work. So the images that I create are, are really what I, what I would call testaments to the lives of the working class and their struggles and the iconography of their resistance. Uh, what I try to do with my photographs is uh, I try to photograph people not as subjects. Instead, I try to bring focus to their dignity and their, their humanity. Uh, as a result of this, uh, my work has taken me around the world, not as many places as Lou has been. The 60 countries is quite a bit, but I think I've probably hit on about, about 20 or 20 or so. That, that's not bad. Uh, I'm able to do this work because of the support of my wife and partner of 30, 35 years or something like that, uh, you know, Ma Maureen uh, Collins. And that's, uh, you know, I'm one of the fortunate people who actually just simply gets to concentrate on doing work the way that, that I want to do it. Um, and th th this, this comes out of the fact that I grew up in a, uh, shall we say, how would we say, let's see, uh, disenfranchised, poor, I don't know, a community in, in, in Houston. And uh, I, I do the work because everyone that I knew that I grew up with, uh, they were either boot blacks, uh, they had the jobs that no one wanted. And, but when they came back to our community, they were Mr. and Mrs. because we respected them because we understood that it wasn't about the work that they did, but it was about the way they treated their families. It was about the dreams that they had for, for their children. So in my work, what I try to do is I try to bring out these aspects of beauty uh, in the black community and also the other communities that I photograph in. Uh, my work, particularly in uh, 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 LGBTQ communities are because of my experiences and, and members of, of my family. Uh, one of the things that I do that's very important to me is that I try to create relationships uh, with everyone that I photograph. So it's not, uh, it's not unusual for me to have relationships with people that I photograph for a decade. Right. Um, and, and that way I get to know a lot more about, about who they are. Uh, I've worked in, in crazy places. Uh, I've worked in places that are, that are sane. I've worked in places sometimes that when I come back, I have to go to Arizona and find a Canyon and just, and just stay there for a week by myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Just like, just, you know, just kind of, kind of come back. But, um, it's uh, photography is it has been, I guess, a recent calling of mine. But what it has done, it has satisfied a need for me to bring the issues of uh, dispossessed people of color throughout the world, but particularly in the uh, United States and emphatically in the American South. Thank you so much, Titus. Um... Officially, again, a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, super, super grateful to have this opportunity to just kind of chit chat. Um, so I, I, I can't help but want to, to talk about this idea of, uh, of disenfranchisement and uh, basically ex being exploited, things of that magnitude and that nature. Um, and Kennedy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually come to you first if you're cool with that. Um, I know recently you were working through an exploitative experience yourself, uh, the event that happened at the Whitney or did not happen at the Whitney. Um, can you give those who didn't hear about it a quick recap and then uh, kind of talk us through how you were thinking in that moment um, and then what internal struggles you may have been feeling because of 
uh, of having to turn down that moment of self-advancement, you know, being attached to a space like the Whitney? Um, essentially, what had happened was um, the Whitney had gone about acquiring artwork through, um, what is it, uh, charity print sales uh, that were going towards different things. There were different print sales. Some were going towards um, uh, specific like bail funds and some were going more towards it. Honestly, they were just going to very various charities. And so rather, in, rather than acquiring the work at full price, they ended up just paying a hundred dollars for it. Um, I think in the moment, it, it, honestly, the experience was, it was quite annoying. Um, they have the means and the funds to acquire the work full price. They chose not to. Um, and so pretty much they could have put on a show if nobody said anything about it, they could have put on a show for say $5,000 and then just did the frames and that be that. And then they make all that money back through people buying tickets to their, you know, to their institution, things like that. So like I said, they have the means to pay artists and go about it the right way, but they chose not to. And they got a lot of blowback from it. I think, and I think there, I think there was a time or a time period where a lot of black artists in particular would have had to, or they would have had to sit down and take it. But I think, I don't know, just being able to not necessarily reap the benefits of those became, that came before us, but having the guidance of those that the artists that came before us was a great help um, in figuring out how to navigate just what had happened. Um, and I mean, I, I think I had to also come to the realization that there were, there's gonna be other opportunities and the Whitney isn't the only place on the planet um, that I can showcase work as well. And I don't know, I, I think that's kind of the thoughts that I've gave it. And at the moment, I'm just kind of over it and ready to move fast. No, it's totally fair, it's totally fair, mm -hmm. it's totally fair. Um, I do really appreciate you. I know that's still fairly raw and I appreciate you being comfortable to, to kind of tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, um, and you know, m one of my pieces was also acquired by the Whitney and I share like a lot of the same sentiments that Kennedy expressed, you know, especially, you know, being pretty new to the space. Um, it was pretty annoying because at first I thought it was a good thing, but then I realized that we have kind of been exploited and, um, you know, how do we, we navigate you know, the space. Um, and yeah, it was kind of like, uh, it was two weeks of, kind of talking about it constantly uh, with my peers and, and mentors. And, you know, I think it was a situation where I had to realize my audience was never the people who attended the Whitney in the first place. Um, and there'll be more opportunities for me to reach the audience that I'm trying to reach. And the audience I'm trying to reach is just black, black folks. Uh, I've been to the Whitney, I didn't see many black folks when I went. So, um, you know, once I kind of came to that realization you know, I was able to kind of move past it and move forward. And it's unfortunate because, you know, they still they still have the pieces, you know, they, they require the pieces, you know, legally uh, in, a, in a gray area. So it's just something that, you know, we've learned from. And, and now when these things happen in the future, you know, people who come behind us, you know, you know Kennedy and myself can kind of offer some, some guidance when it eventually happens again. Courtney, I see you uh, wanted to chime in. Can I just say that I'm I'm really excited. Um, this what this moment is about, I think, and what y'all did was act in in solidarity and collaboration rather than from a place of individualism. So I think historically, white supremacy has taught us that we are all rugged individuals and we achieve on our own and we do things on our own by our own talents and our own strengths. And in fact, I think that when we work collectively. When, when we're working with other people for a purpose that's greater than just our individual selves, that's when we can achieve the mo most success. And I think that's what you all did. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm really kind of moved by this idea of the collective action um, because I think that's something that we have all these we have so many historical representatives who've told us, so many ancestors who've told us how to move together. And I think it's hard sometimes to not go, well, what about me? Like, I, I think I can do it. You know, I think I can be the one to open the gate for everybody and get caught up in that. Um, 
and so I, I'm also curious about this idea of, of have there been times where, you know, where you have allowed yourself to be exploited because you knew that it could actually open the gate for a bunch of folks. Titus, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Have there been moments in your career where that's happened? Yeah, I, I guess that the one of the closest times to that, uh, I'll talk about when I initially began uh, pursuing an M MFA at a rather important uh, Midwestern art school. Uh, I, I arrived there, uh, my wife was on the plane going back to North Carolina, so I decided to go into the art, sc art school. And I was walking through into the photography area, and so I was approached by this uh, third year, uh, you know, MFA uh, white student. And so the guy walked up to me and said, hi, are you, you must be Titus Hagens. And I looked at him and I said, well, I am. I said, yeah. And so his next question was, well, how does it feel to get into this university through affirmative action? And so initially uh, what I wanted to do was probably hit the guy or, 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 or worse, you know, or, or, or become real vocal to him. But I said, you know, I'm going to be here for three years. Let me figure out how, how to deal with this. So I turned the question back to him and I asked him, I, uh, how did you get here? And so he told me that he, uh, a professor of his, he was in his second photography course in an undergraduate college and his professor asked him, what was he going to do? And he said he had no plans. It was April and he suggested that he apply to the school. And the guy said, well, it's too late. And he said, don't worry about that. I got this worked out for you. You're gonna get an application. I'm gonna call them and everything's gonna be worked out for you. So I asked him, I said, well, so, you know, what's your work like? Where have you exhibited? What have you done and, and whatever? And the only place he had ever exhibited was in the room where graduate students get to exhibit their work. And so I began to tell him that I had created three pretty large bodies of work, uh, talked about the places that I exhibited and et cetera. And I said, so it sounds to me like you got into this university through affirmative action rather than me. And, and so uh, the entire year though, um, my weakness was actually in dark room, you know, was uh, dark room wet processes. And uh, I was hoped, had hoped to work with this person who was a really fine, fine printer. And that person really wouldn't speak to me. And even though I was enrolled in two classes each semester with, with this professor, uh, you know, if they said one word to me, you know, throughout the week, and I'm talking about where you've got graduate students, where you've got five graduate students in a class for two hours, and nobody's talking to you, you know, you, it's kind of gets kind of obvious. So anyway, so, so I, so I, I ended up leaving there and I, I uh, uh, went to University of, University of Michigan, uh, you know, they gave me a Rackham Fellowship because they thought the work was important, supported me in everything I did. And, and, and et cetera. So there are times when you are alone because besides me, there was one other black person in the school of art. And so there was no one else that I could go to or even know to that could give support and help me to figure out what to do and essentially how to handle you know, this situation. So you know, there are times when I guess that you know, we don't always speak up and uh you know we we and as and i'm a pretty radical guy i mean i was a, I was i was a panther when i was in my 20s so you know you, you know i you know i was very serious about this stuff yeah. so but there are times when when sometimes we have to say okay let me look and see what's the end game you know what's the long road you know what's the whatever and so i got where i needed to be i you know so you know sometimes it works one way and sometimes it works another way no, I totally understand that. I'm, I'm curious, since we have two curators on the call, I'm curious just how you help to navigate exploitation for, you know, photographers of color, black, black photographers, most notably, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities for galleries to go, oh, we have our one person on display, or, you know, we've got the one section of black books in the back that, you know, that black photographer shot, you know, how do you help them to realize that it's, it is, you are part of the system that could be oppressing the bodies that are making these images and are being exploited in the ways they are. Jessica or Courtney, feel free to chime in. <laughs> um, just if you 
well uh that's a hard i mean that's a hard question michael because i don't it, it depends on the institution that you're working with or working for and um for me at cds i would say that my experience was one of you know i was the only program director of color in the institution and and i thought naively because so I was born in 1958 and I'm from New York. I was a child of integration. My parents practiced respectability politics. And so I believed that all I had to do was just show the white people that I was as good as them. I was as smart as them. And, you know, and then everything would be cool. And um, I got to CDS and I thought, I'm going to throw those doors open and black and brown people are just going to come in because I'm here now and like, they'll know it's safe. And um, they knew what was true and I did not. Um, I, I thought it was safe, but in fact, it wasn't safe. And um, I think that over time, I persisted, build, built relationship it, within that community um, and uh, did things that were important for the institution and did things that were important for my own growth. Um, I did have the opportunity to meet some awesome black artists working outside of where I was like Titus um, and grew and grew and got stronger and stronger and realized that the collective way was the way to go that I needed to go outside of, of the white institution in order to um, strengthen myself and, and teach myself things that could make access for black and brown people more possible. It's not heaven. Like, I mean, Michael, you're the second black program director in the 30 year history of the place. Um, and I'm the first. Right. So, you know, you, you dance and you fight. That's how it goes. Yeah, yeah. I'll chime in here. Thank you for that, Courtney. Um, I think that, you know, there's a long history of predominantly white-led institutions benefiting from the disenfranchisement and the labor of Black artists in the community. And as Courtney just said, it's never safe uh, unless it's ours. And as I alluded to in the earlier part of this conversation, this is why I think it's so important that we create spaces that are our own. That notion of bias and force is so important. And also it gives artists uh, and art workers this ability to be empowered in their own work and in their own community. And not until we start to mold these spaces and these things for ourselves will we, will we really see that. Um, right now in the chat, I'm gonna post this, um, this group. I think it's about seven of us, uh, the North Carolina Black Artists for Liberation that drafted this letter that we sent out to a number of North Carolina uh, led arts and cultural spaces. And I think in this moment after um, COVID, you know, really became the thing that people are really talking about immediately followed by the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there became this onslaught of white organizations turning to black artists and black leaders in the community asking, you know, what do we do now? Which, which is really just backwards. You know, Audre Lorde says that there's this quote, black and third world people are expected to educate white people as to our humanity. Women are expected to educate men. Lesbians and gay men are expected to educate the heterosexual world. The oppressors maintain their position and evade responsibility for their own actions. There's this constant drain of energy which might be better used in redefining ourselves and devising realistic scenarios for altering the present and constructing the future. And I think that there are a number of people on this call as well as in our community that really use their energy to construct the, the futures that we need. But this is all of our work. You know, it, it can't just weigh on the backs of black artists or black yeah. art workers to do this. I think it really is this moment of all hands on deck. And so, um, yeah, if you haven't yet signed this petition, uh, I would appreciate it. North Carolina would appreciate it. The world would appreciate it. And so please disseminate it to your network so that maybe this is one way that we can start to see some kind of change, Courtney. I just, when, um, thank you so much for that, Jess. That was 
really perfect. And that's exciting that that letter exists. I just wanted to, um, I've said Titus's name too many times already today. So I'm gonna stop after I say this, but I, I just wanna thank you Titus for acknowledging that you were able to do some of the things that you have done in order to shape your career because Maureen held that space for you because your wife held that space for you. That's like so important. Um, for us to acknowledge that, you know, we're not just magicians that, that like we have family, we, and often black women that are, are pushing us along and holding us up. Yeah, I, there's, there hasn't been an opening that I've had, or actually any time that I've spoken about my photography, that I don't make that point very clear. Uh, because I, I see myself as being in a very, very lucky position because she not only believes in my work, but she is willing to, well, I mean, you know, do without, you know, I, I mean, we, we don't have a second home in the mountains, I'm sure, because, you know, because I, 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 you know, I have to sometimes go and spend a month in Cuba or Haiti or somewhere in Brazil. And, you know, wh where does that money come from? Well, it comes out of, out of our future plans, but it's important that I do the work uh, the way that I see that it needs to be done. And she believes in what I'm trying to do and is willing to put herself and many of the things that we that she wants or needs or whatever and says, you know, I'm not gonna do that because this is important. It's, it's very important, but, but yeah, we, we, we all exist. And it's, and it's the same way with, you know, with Keith and Chandra, uh, you know, you know, two people who, who are in this, this long-term relationship who support each other. And when I met them, I think two years ago for the first time, it, it was, it was like going home. And, and, and when I walked in and there was all of this static in New Orleans that was keeping me from getting to them by the arts institutions, you know, you don't want to go in that neighborhood. You don't need to go see, you know, all of all of this stuff. And I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I got there finally in, in their house and we sat and we talked for, I don't know, three hours. You know, it, it was just, just too long. And, but it's because we understood that we were a part of the same fight and that we needed each other's support. And that we needed to understand that there were other people that were doing this in the same way that we were doing it, that had a similar goal. And in that, it lets us be able to continue. Yeah. Okay, I've got to ask this question then. Because you, you all, have, you've just set up a really beautiful segue to talk about gender relative to this work. Um, so Chandra, I'm just gonna ask you, uh, can you, I mean, I would imagine you know, your experience as a maker and a, and a woman, you know, you're a black woman, like there have got to be things that you feel that you've not been able to do because people have said, nah, but the moment Keith shows up, they're like, oh yeah, you can do it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I don't, I don't know if, I can't recall of, of anything like that, but what I can recall is like when I, when I first began to learn photography, because it was so male dominated, you know, a lot of guys would, that were in photography that knew him would say like, why are you teaching her? You know, like, you know, just things like that. But um, I just, I, I know that it, it, it was a male dominated uh, industry. I'm, I'm happy now to see that they're more females involved in, and a lot of young African-American uh, women. Not no, not, not enough, but, 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 but at least more, when I, more than when I started. Um, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I've had, I've also had people or someone say, you know, um, and, and maybe looking at the works or talking about a representation of the works, um, you know, there's, you know, there's Keith Calhoun and there's Chandra McCormick and there really is, we have our own different styles, but they say it in a way that, 
you know, I don't know. You they say it in a way that yeah, yeah. that it, I'm less maybe mm-hmm. <laughs> or mm-hmm. oh no, are we losing them? All right, we might have to come back. We'll give it can, another can, can, two can you hear me? Oh, Sh- Chandra, you're back. Yeah, I got your voice. You're back. You're back. You just froze for a hot second. So you said that sometimes they say it in a way that, you know, makes you feel lesser than in the way in which it's delivered. And well, then we lost you right after that statement. Yeah, the, the way that it's been delivered sometimes is so that they feel that 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 the work that I do was maybe a lesser or or that it was a difference. There was some some difference there, you know, which there is. Like I said, the styles are different even though we work together and we sometimes work on a lot of the same things, but I believe that I, I have my own style and he has yeah. his own style. I think, um, and that's sort of been a problem because Chandra, with galleries and everything, it never was easy for us. So that's why we represented ourselves. I never had galleries give us much opportunity, but that wasn't gonna stop us you know, that, hey, because I'm not with this gallery. I mean, I use my space in my community and I done met people from all over the world right here in, in, in the neighborhood, what they call the hood. So it's a matter where you stand up at and show your presence. If you're not in the big gallery downtown, don't don't cry, just keep pushing, you know. Like Chandra, I would always keep pushing the shutter, you know, regardless how heavy it is, you know. So I think that, um, well, I'm taking over no. I think what happened is right now is that, um, you know, when I was young, I was able to live in Los Angeles and I lived around Hollywood and I was able to um, see a lot of people go to the hill and come back down the hill. And, uh, And I was able to be around a lot of people that were, you know, you, like I said, you had a lot of things going on down in, South Central that 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 allowed me to, to to appreciate art. So when I came back to New Orleans and met Chandra, you know, we just created our own space and just, you know, we went out to galleries and try to get shows and stuff. And then, you know, it didn't stop us from shooting. We knew it was important to go out and make work by any means necessary. That uh, and same as the young sister saying, just claim spaces now, you know. Even the churches should become, you know, if I can get that big church down the street, it'll have prints all through there. So I'm just saying that <laughs> a lot of times we overlook spaces that's sitting in our neighborhood that could be, you know, you'd be surprised that right here at L9, we don't have to advertise or sign out. Children come work, they make work, they learn. Matt, even with the cell phone, is a weapon now. And mm. I think that teaching them that they can take that thousand dollar phone that I see kids 10, 12 years old got now can go to City Park and just take pictures of flowers and put them in a magnet. If you get ten dollars for that's more than what you had, you know. But so so we've been blessed though that uh and again for as women in photography here in the deep south, uh even with me and Chandra, you know, when we've been in jazz procession, uh people want to know, well, who are you? Where are you from? You know, usually it's not set up for the native to be able to become keepers of their own culture. It's always been other people coming in our community and taking and not putting nothing back. But when you come to Keith and Chandra, you know, we live in the community, you know, it's just like when we go into the prison, we live on both sides of the lens. We know people that, that we grew up with, so I'm not threatened, you know? So we've been fortunate to work with people in the prisons. Uh, there's a lot of brothers here in, 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 the, in the prison that are doing a lot of things other than playing checkers and dominoes all day, changing conditions inside the prison. Mm-hmm. So through the lens, it has allowed me to get to places to meet with those type of people to show that, hey, we got a lot of things going on. So the camera has been very powerful. You know, as Gordon Park said, it's been our choice of weapon, you know, a weapon that it's powerful in the AK in my eyes, right? Right. Courtney, you had your hand up briefly. 
Uh, I would just say that um, a, another issue is the ways that it is who the curators are, who the gatekeepers are, who's reading work and what their ability to read the work is, like how literate they are in, in any particular cultural visioning. So for example, most of my teachers were male and white. And mm -hmm. so when I was interested in documenting my domestic landscape, I kept being told, you need a project, you need a project. And I, and I would say, but, but I have a project. Like, this is what I'm doing. I'm looking at my family. I'm looking at what, you know, our interior landscape is. And that, that wasn't of interest to them because they were of the school that, you know, your camera is a, an instrument that can take you places you're not supposed to go. You know, you can be an explorer if you have a camera. You can go and see the exotic if you have a camera. And it's like, but what if I just want to tell my story about my own life? That, that was a... You know that was a vision that wasn't that didn't start becoming popular until you know the early 90s mid 90s and um i'd already been working for a little while by then um and now of course yeah much more people are are turning the cameras many more people have turned cameras on themselves and people are are talking about these issues but there was a time when you know white men were not interested in the way that I was telling the story about my life. There were other people making images of black people that they were more interested in. Lou, um, you, you've been, you know, you've been in the commercial space, you've worked uh, extensively um, in and around and you've moved kind of from commercial to fine art and documentary practice. Um, what kind of, of, as we're having conversations about being in, in schools that are, you know, dominated by white men, what kind of advice would you give, uh, you know, a current undergrad photographer, for example, who's trying to find their identity in a white-led art department? You're muted, my friend. Lou, you're muted. Thank you. Yes, um, a hard one. Um, it has been it has been wonderful to hear the the comments, the exploitation that I get a lot, and leading up to your to your question is that uh, we are I am my studio is constantly being asked for images, prints, the value, they know that there's value to them for auctions and, and ways to, but the institutions, the colleges, the galleries, the museums have, and I came up with this statistic, and I'll show you where I'm going with this in a minute, statistic that no local black photographer had been shown in any major institution in Boston ever. Wow. wow. So we have been going to um, many of the museums and galleries, Eastman House, all the galleries. There's a little consortium here in Boston that has been saying that not only are you not exhibiting are you not teaching us in the schools, teaching black photography in school, not exhibiting us, mm -hmm. but most importantly, in a funny kind of way, you're not showing the work or collecting the work for your permanent collection. So we mm -hmm. have been putting pressure, we've been literally on Zoom because of COVID with mm -hmm. many of the institutions around. So, the question of how to integrate into um, commercial work and making a living with, uh, you know, I've worked for National Geographic and Time and Newsweek and all of these, in presenting the kind of photography, and Courtney is, was so articulate about how she was doing her own community mm -hmm. 
And these art directors were not paying attention because it was not part of their I just, there was not part of their interest. It is so important that for African-American black people of color coming into these institutions to be sure that they're showing bodies of work that do are somewhat expansive on the ideas that they are involved with. There has to be a personal component to it, your own, but so working with photographers who are already doing it is really an important way for them to get into finding photographers who are doing work that's similar that you're interested in rather than just going out. But I constantly talk to my students. Now, I didn't go to school. I didn't, my degrees were in physics. I had no photographic education. So knocking on the doors of Time Magazine, of Fortune Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. I was showing work that was not only my community, but that had a, a much more universal. As Titus was saying, you know, he's been to many countries, going to these countries, to these other places, going to, he has gone to, I went to Japan <laughs> to say, I not only could work overseas in an international idea, but I could go to places that weren't just my, but I would bring a point of view that was so much more um, to the point of how do you see another culture in their eyes rather than just the white eyes that you're, you've been constantly. And that's what the Pan-Africa, you know, that Africa has been maligned in in Western media for generations. Mm -hmm. How do they see themselves? And we bring an entirely different eye to being able to show in the majority world how that looks. And that's what I've been talking about. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question exactly. You're, you're, you're close. Yeah, I get, I get you've given me the step after school, the step after school or, or the step around school because uh, plenty of plenty of makers don't do this. This is, I mean, Mark gave us an example, you know, Mark was working in a very different spot and found photography and then said, this was the medium I want to jump into. Um, and similar to you, you, you were doing physics and, and found photography. And then you said, this is the work I want to get into. I, I am curious though, because I myself, you know, did an MFA in a majority white institution. And, you know, I, it was really one of those things that I grappled with was finding myself and understanding my own identity relative to that space, because there was nobody who looked like me doing work that's in the right. space that I'm, I'm working in. So right. I think that's, I, I, in, in, I, I'm actually asking a question from, uh, from one of our audience members. Um, so thank you. Uh, so that, I think there is something to be said about this when, we're, when you're being trained, and I use air quotes because training is, is relative in a lot of ways. Um, how do you help to find your, your identity in white lead spaces? Um, Kennedy, not to put you on the spot, uh, but you talked about having developed your 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 photographic uh, you know talents about uh, five years ago. You know what was that experience like for you? How did you get into that space? And I'm, I'm you know were you in conversation with with black community and black photographers while you were doing it? Um, I'm trying to think, but um, yeah, it started when I was in high school. I took. Um, three photo courses. We had photo one, photo two, and photo three. And then from there, I decided I was wanting to go to college for it. I attended UNC Greensboro. And um, I mean, it, it was the cool school, but I just, I felt like that wasn't the space I wanted to learn in. Um, I had initially, where, what, what were the, I'm trying to think of the course criteria, but it was just something about it that I just was not digging. Um, it, what you had to do in order to major in photography is get an all around studio art degree. 
And as I was trying to pursue that, I was having to take a lot of drawing courses. It was not for me. I did not like it because I'm just, I don't, I, I can't draw. Um, and then every time when I'd be like, um, I'm having some, a hard time drawing, the guy would be like, oh, you have to see it. And, uh, and I was like, look, it is a particular gift to be able to project what you have in your mind through your hands onto whatever medium or piece of paper thing, canvas you're drawing on. I just don't have that. It would have been several more courses like that until I finally got to the curriculum that I knew that I wanted to be in. And I just wanted an easier route to take to work to get there. Um, I decided that I also, I, I decided I was just gonna get a minor in photography rather than um, just going that route. I could immediately jump into what it is that I was wanting to learn. And then um, I was going to major in African-American studies. Um, it, I, I just, I don't know. It was, I don't know if it was just Greensboro, but I just was not feeling, um, just the school, it wasn't for me. And so I decided that I was gonna take a break and um, take this like kind of weird gap year situation and um, do what I just, do what I felt would be best for me. And um, yeah, so I just started taking images of my own and I had completed my photo minor. So I received a lot of just guidance in regards to how to tell a story um, there. And I just took the information that I learned and I ran with it. And um, I, I went to a lot of other people. I found a lot of mentors to guide me through commercial and the editorial realms. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I ended up doing. And I think eventually I'll go back to school, but um, I think I'll, when I do decide to to go back to school, I'll be in the same boat as the person that had asked that question, trying to figure out how to navigate these white spaces and say, hey, my story is, is cool, it's fresh, and it's my story, and it doesn't have to be painful for it to be alluring. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't, I don't know, just, I think that's just what I'm trying to figure out how to do. So I think pretty much being willing to go into these spaces and figure out how to set boundaries and communicate your boundaries is really important because although these people have been in the game longer than you, um, they don't know your story and what you have to bring to the table. So. Uh, I, I know Jessica wanted to say something and then Courtney, I've got you right after her. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, Kennedy hit the nail on the head when she talked about mentorship when we're often in these spaces, it feels like you're in a bubble, um, but there is a world outside of the bubble, you know? Um, and in any, in any kind of institution that's predominantly white space, um, there are black people and black artists outside of those spaces. And so this might be an opportunity to use, um, uh, to use the, uh, uh, platform that this space provides for you to then reach outside of the space. Um, so I, I'd mentioned, um, you know, leading the Black Law Student Association. There are like three Black kids in the law school. But we came together and we created this platform. And then the next year of students filled these seats. And now the Black Law Student Association is even more empowered than it was at the start. You know, I think a lot of this is, again, just making it up. If there's something that you're looking for or somebody that you want to work with, when you're in a space that seems like you can't reach outside of, you can, and it's sometimes as simple as an email to Courtney, right? Like you might've seen her on a call or seen her on a panel somewhere and you're like, wow, I, she's speaking my language. And you reach, you know, it, it could even be a DM in her Instagram account, right? And, and that connection that exists, like the, the internet has, has de democratized the world and, and the sector so much that you don't, and, and even now, right? Like we're all in such different places in different cities and different states, but we're here together in this moment. And there's, a, you know, like it, it was a simple email that Bryce sent out that's like, hey, are you available? Could, can we be in community today? And so I encourage you, uh, Kayla, whenever you're in a space like this that feels like you're alone, uh, you're not. And it could be as simple as an email or a tap on a social media platform for somebody who is already doing the work that you want to do. D dig in with them deeper and find out how they did it. If there's um, 
I was listening to a panel a couple of days ago with um, the two founders of Black Market Vintage. And they were talking about how one of them went to this fair and found all these hot combs, like these really old hot combs. And she was so jazzed about it. And she went to this appraiser and she was like, she knew, right? like, this is about to be, <laughs> this is about to be so exciting. I know that they're going to be valued so high. Like these are relics, you know, like cultural relics. And the appraisers were like, what are these things? This looks like um, maybe this was a utensil that was used in, in a kitchen <laughs> at some point, right? Like that cultural competi competency piece is just so missing and we can't rely on that. You know, like that's not their work. It is, this, is, this is for us, right? And so that's why it's also so important that we fill in all those seats. When I heard that, I immediately Googled, what does it take to become a, an appraiser, right? It's like an avoid that exists. And there's probably so few black appraisers because it didn't seem like an avenue that we could really explore. Or when you're in an institution, they don't present it as an option for you. So I think if, if any, if I can relay any advice to you, Kayla, it would be to, to think about those, those voids where they exist um, that, that, that uplift you and the work that you're already doing and fill them, fill them and reach out to other people who are doing something really similar because that all only just, um, it only uplifts the whole network. Courtney, you might get a few extra DMs after this, but. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to um, shout out Kennedy's work with um, the beautiful project, which is exactly what you're talking about, Jess. Like Jamaica Gilmer and so, and some colleagues of hers um, created this institute, what is now an institution that has exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But the beautiful project started here in Durham, and it started because Jamaica needed it. Like Jamaica had come here, her spouse was a graduate student. She was, she's a photographer. She was looking for a way to work and a place to be. And um, after having some challenging experiences, she was like, we need something for black women and girls. We need something for black women and girls to be able to use photography and writing to reflect their lives and to support each other. And Kennedy, I know that you have worked with the beautiful project for for quite a few years. And so I was I was thinking about Jamaica and then you said mentor. So it was like, uh -huh. I got all excited because you answered my comment, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> Titus, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I, so unfortunately I was kicked off by my my internet provider, but so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm coming in on this and what I have to say may or may not be relevant, but I hope it is. But anyway, but but so when, when, I, when I began in photography, um, even though I have an MFA, I, I am self-taught. And when I went to graduate school, I already knew where my work was going to be. I already knew what kind of photographer I wanted, wanted to be. So essentially what I did was I made sure that nothing uh, forced me to deviate from, you know, fr from what I wanted to do and, and who, I, who I wanted to be. There, in, in most situations, there won't be mentors for for black photographers. One because most people in that are in, in, in the majority really look at at people of color quite differently from the way that from the way that we do because we have we have a lived experience about this. We have a different type of under of understanding about everything from about our hair texture to everything to you know to the clothes that we that we wear and all of these things that many times that are. I won't say offensive, but that, that they kind of step back from, you know, we, we embrace because this is where, where we come from. So we, we, need, we, need to have, we need to have a plan. Uh, you know, I can remember, you know, my first year at this place that I was at, uh, you know, I, 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 spent, I spent from 9, from 9 p.m. until 4 a.m. in the dark room learning to print. Okay, and that was because there was no one there who was willing to come and say, "This is how you make a fine print." And I'm just not talking about a, a oh great black. I'm I'm talking about a real museum quality print. No one was willing to do that. I had to put forth the effort to do that. When I went to Michigan, you know, I wanted to take it further, and 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 I said, you know, you guys brought me here. You promised me support, blah blah blah, for whatever reasons and etc. And I came up with a plan 
and they supported me at every point because I had a plan. I had something that I was that I was trying to achieve. I had a direction I wanted to go in, and I had incremental steps of how to get there. You know, so I ended up I ended up studying and, and working with Cole Weston, and you know, at University of Michigan's expense. So you know, so we so we have to sometimes do things differently, and we can't be afraid of putting in the hard and difficult work. And sometimes that work is 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 you're 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 being alone and and uh you know realizing that where i've worked and i've worked you know i've been work with magnum photographers with guys from seven and 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 you know i find myself sometimes just away off in a little corner doing my own thing but sooner or later they start gathering around me because they know that what i'm going for so you know we, we just we, we just have to we have to have a different plan of attack and we can make it, but we just have to believe in ourselves. So just, just by a quick show of hands, and I know that some of us have degrees and some of us don't. Um, I'm just curious because we've had a couple of mentions of self-taughtness at this point, you know, school of hard knocks. How many people on this call are self-taught? Started making whatever and did it. And you may have gotten trained after the fact, but your initial I picked up and it was because after that, that I, I went and found the thing. So I, I just want to show that as a, as a, as a norm rather than an exception. Um, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so I, I want to pivot for a hot second. I, I, you know, I think that part of, part of the thing relative to getting into photography as a Black individual, everyone has consistently talked about needing to see themselves, whether it be you know, filling a gap, filling a void, uh, whether it be I, I didn't see that thing. So I went ahead and took advantage of trying to, to make it, whether it be uh, everybody I talk to seems to have a very specific idea of the, of the very mundane or not mundane, but uh, oppressive version of black identity. So, you know, the only stories that we get to hear, as Kennedy talked about earlier, is, are these things that are like trauma filled. Um, so, so I want to I want to pivot to representation um, because I think that you know we say pictures are worth a thousand words, right? So, and and we love to we actually are watching mainstream cinema do certain things image wise, you know, through things like Lovecraft Country, where you know we're able to actually see stuff worked out. You know, Gordon Parks is literally living in front of us uh, in, in movement, and so so I, I want to stop for a minute and kind of talk about this and and. Um, I want to do it in two parts. So the first part is the, the danger around making the work. All right. So we've all lived through different periods of the black liberation struggle. Right. Um, and, you know, Mark, for example, you've been out in the streets, you know, making the work. So, so I, I want you to talk a little bit about that experience. You know, you're representing uh, the version of the story from being within the machine. You know, if, if Black people are trying to get free, then let's show you what it's like from our perspective of what we think are things that need to be seen. So can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, what that's like, you know, when you're, when you're out in the world um, and, and how these periods, for example, have shaped both your work surrounding our freedom and work that is not directly tied to our freedom. You, may, you, you make other work. It's not all marches and protests. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the vast majority of my work like, is not marches and protests. The vast majority of my work is commercial and editorial. Um, and I just think it just speaks to like the call, like the quote unquote call to arms that was kind of had in New York City where all these commercial and editorial, you know, black photographers said, hey, you know, the best way I know how to contribute to this is to, you know, pick up my camera. Um, and, and try to document it. Um, and you know, fortunately for me, I had experience just working, you know, attending as a protester, you know, in 2014 and 2015 and 2016. Um, so you know, I, I was familiar with you know how protests go in uh, in New York City. And you know, I think for me, the the thought that continuously ran into my mind is like, you know, this is our, a first person account. This is a first person account of what's being told uh, in these current times. Um, and 
And I think that is extremely important. I feel like this is the first time in American history where the, the image is 100% democratized because it doesn't take much. You just need an iPhone to, to, to tell your story. It doesn't have to be editorial print quality uh, to, to, to get the point across and to actually tell the story and the, and the emotions that are happening um, in the moment. And one thing that I did re re uh, recognize almost immediately that there was a community um, a community of artists. So, you know, other photographers or, or people uh, documenting it in the, in the ways that they knew how, it was kind of like the head nod, you know, we all had masks on. So it's always, you know, direct eye contact, uh, which I thought was, was very, very communal. Um, we were walking across the Brooklyn Bridge where the cars usually drive. One side of the, you know, one side of the bridge is protesters the other side is other people beeping their horns stopping their cars raising a fist through their sunroof i mean there's there's a the element of community made on the brooklyn bridge that i had never seen uh, before um so you know there of course there were times where we had you know direct altercations and physical violence you know at the hands of the police yes but um it just felt it felt like history was being made enough in, in, the, in uh, the community that was had especially you know given the time you know this was you know at the height was May, June, the, the, the preceding two months, we had been locked down. Uh, we had been calling unemployment, especially many artists, you know, calling unemployment, just trying to figure out what are we gonna do next? And, you know, I am a new father. I just had, you know, my, my first child, she was born on February 15th. Um, so a lot of it was, um, you know, telling her like, yeah, you were born in New York at the, cra like the craziest time. Um, and so like, I just wanted to, you know, speak to her as an adult in 2040 about what, what the, those times were uh, in, our, in our first few months. Um, but it was definitely an interesting experience and it definitely, you know, the, the, the pandemic colored it in a way that is unique to this year specifically. It's a shared moment that the globe is having. Um, so it's important to tell like the black version, the black first person account. And I think that's what inspired so many uh, photographers and artists to, to, to tell the story of their time. So you, 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 uh, you gave us the invocation of the 5-0, so I want to talk about the 5-0 for a hot second. Um, Keith and Chandra, you two live in the South. Mm -hmm. You are always interacting uh, in spaces where, um, and, and let me, let me, let me stop, stop there and, and, and recalibrate. Police brutality is not a Southern thing. I will say that again, police brutality is not a Southern thing. Um, and so I would love you to talk a little bit about, um, from your perspective within the South, what is it like to have cameras out when police officers are present? I think that's something that we don't necessarily talk about the potential precarity therein. And uh, it, 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 we'll start with, with uh, Chandra and Keith and then kick it around. But what is that like? when you're doing something over here and they show up, what's that, what's that experience like for you? Well, when I, when I think about that question, I think about um, the controlled situations we have here when we have different celebrations or whatever, like Mardi Gras, the crowd control thing. Um, so, and then with, with um, you know, with the annual parades, that's like a every Sunday thing. It's four to five hours long parades through different communities. There's always police escorts. So we're always photographing people, police. They're always on horseback or, or something riding in the parade. Um, I don't think I necessarily feel threatened at those events. They're like there to supposedly serve us during our time of um, celebrating. Um, so I'm used to seeing them like in crowded situations and I photograph them as well as the people. So. Well, um, right now, uh, because of certain situations that happens during during the parading, they like to try to blame it to the for people who sponsoring the parade. But if, for instance, a second line might go through four or five neighborhoods, and at the end of the day, you might have heard about a shooting. Not saying it was the people in the second line, but the news gonna announce. So that means 
the club from now on gonna have to pay more police security to parade. And, you know, in New Orleans, we have what you call parades uh, every Sunday at one time, and, and it's put on by the community or by the social club. So with the money that is charging, same thing with the musicians in the French quarters, you know, they make them pay um, to get a permit um, to go play, you know, and and just last week, some little kids, somebody ran in the store and stole something. They ran out and grabbed the little kids who was out there playing the music. So, you know, we always seen confrontation like that here in the city, you know. And okay, I I, I didn't think about that, but I I also to add to the charging them and for permits and everything. Most times, you would think or probably in other cities, people who add something culturally to the city shouldn't have to pay for a permit. You know, they're the ones that- Especially kids. Yeah, well, they're the ones that are entertainment for the so-called tourists since New Orleans has become a tourist city. We were a port city at one time, but now we're a tourist destination. And so these are your entertainers that people come to see, and yet you charge them a, uh, for a permit in order to do that. So I don't think that's right either. Yeah, well, with gentrification is so much of the city. I mean, I have to kind of ride around and look for kids playing in the inner city now. I don't see even all the black bars didn't change, the neighborhood. I don't know, gentrification kills the spirit of the community. And for instance, we photograph a community, uh, Treme. And at one time, you can go through Treme and didn't even know folks in there offer you something to eat because you would see old ladies and screen doors, people, children playing outside. It's just full of light. Now it's painted up real nice, but it's no life, you know? So, you know, that's why we work the back roads more now, but it's just scary times in the city for me. For a subject matter, you know, I don't, it don't have, New Orleans used to be soulful. I mean, you can, I mean, you know, they'll have a jazz procession behind if a dog died and you can go out and make imagery, you know. So now you don't have that flavor, you know what I'm saying, you know. I think what happened was they put us out the city and didn't realize they lo they threw all the flavor out too, you know. It's pretty bland. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't want to get too much of it. Sorry. Right? <laughs> you're good. You're good. No, that's, wow. Um. Uh, we did have a comment from uh, from one of our um, audience members that says cameras can be mistaken for weapons in the hands of black photographers. Um, and so I, I, I know that police are trained, for example, that, you know, hands kill. So I'm, I'm always nervous as I see these images, you know, especially when confrontation is happening. If you're, if you're snapping, you know, I'm always nervous that you may become a recipient of, and I'm all, I'm just curious, like, if, has anybody else experienced maybe even like the, the, the shortness of breath in the presence of a police officer? Lou's got his hand up. Uh, I'm going to expand a little, a little on this because again, I'm, I'm my, I'm a, in a different area, but you, the physicality, the, the, the boots on the ground, the act of being a photographer, which is an art form very different from all the others in that you have to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can write Moby Dick from your hotel room, but you, you if you're yeah. gonna be cold or you're gonna be shot at in a war, one of the things that, that uh, uh, several of the other members have talked about, about how we are, uh, what did they say? A, a camera is a weapon in the hands of a black photographer. It's a brilliant, brilliant observation. But over the years, because I shoot in so many of these kinds of really, really volatile situations, mm -hmm. and also in different cultures, like I said, I've done 60 countries. So I'm a street photographer in a completely different culture. And as a black man, you're probably close to the bottom of the of the food chain in in, in those situations. You're going to be so. I I tell my students, and this is something that I've developed. I literally can become invisible. 
I mean, you can literally, with a camera, I have cameras coming out of every orifice on my body when I'm out in these situations. So it's not like I'm hiding. And I have uh, had an argument a few weeks ago about Black Lives Matters covering those protests because you we were saying, oh, I'm shooting with a 300 millimeter. I'm using, I'm using a wide angle. I'm six inches from your face. Right. Wide angles, wide angle lenses make you mean. Yeah. You know, I'm in people's, I'm confronting people. I want to be close to those situations. So I have learned to become invisible. I have learned techniques in different cultures to make me disappear when I'm literally two feet from somebody taking pictures. And so the police thing is the most volatile because they look at us, like I said, in the bottom of the food chain and they want to know, this is a little more physicality, but as a black person, I have to be constantly conscious of that mm -hmm. and adapt all kinds of techniques, physicalities, ways of doing things so that I keep myself protected because getting hit in the back of the head with a billy club is not a way to become a good photographer. And, uh, and so it's, so I have literally, it's a little bit more of the visceral aspects of being on the streets, taking pictures, but it is a really, really uh, an important component of being in people's faces and being able to take pictures as a black person. Go ahead, Titus. Yeah. So I, I started having, I, I'll say these, I'll just call them run-ins or whatever, with, with law enforcement uh, after 9-11. Uh, and I was just always searched at least five times before I got on a plane. I, re I remember one or two times when I was searched so closely by TSA, I told the person that I really like to be kissed on a date. And, and, you know, I mean, it was, it was that bad, but, but I, I, I've also been, been simply, uh, you know, I've had police draw guns on me and, you know, in, in my own community, you know, as I was, you know, and as I was photographing. So, you, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a part of, it's a part of what, you know, what the experience is like. Uh, you know, I, I've been in, in, in other countries, uh, and I was in, um, uh, uh, I was in Morocco, and I took took a photograph of, of of this guy, and he simply did not want his photograph his photograph taken, and it just it, it was it just became so confrontational. And of course, I don't speak Arabic, but fortunately, you know, I was there with, with someone you know who was translating, you know, who helped you know you know just get you know get out of the situation. But it, it's the confrontations and the possibility of confrontations with, with police, it's just, it's a part of, it's a part of what the, the experience is like. And uh, it, it's simply because as African-Americans, our daily lives always have a greater possibility of there being some sort of interaction with police, even from driving down the street or walking down, walking down the sidewalks, whether it's in our neighborhoods are, are, are any other any other na neighborhoods except that you know we need to just figure out ways uh, to make sure that we don't uh, as Lou said get hit in the head with a billy club or, or worse that you know we don't get a, a, a bullet in, in, in us so yeah you know it's it's there and, and we all experience it Courtney and this is a, a story from the other side of, of that that fence. So I was fumbling around in my studio looking for my documentary evidence. This is a, a photocopy, a colored photocopy of a patch and the back of my ID card. I can't find the front, but in the, um, in like 1982, I was an auxiliary police officer in the city of New York. And so I went through police training and I did go on patrol. I had a uniform, I had a billy stick and, um, the sergeant on our first walk around through the neighborhood and it was in my neighborhood and I was doing it because I thought that I was going to be doing a community service. Um, bridging again I have these ideas that bridging uh, like community and and the police and um, we came upon with with the sergeant my partner and the sergeant and I came upon um, a, a transient person sitting on a stoop 
It happened to be an older white man. Um, and the sergeant that was with us told him to get up off the stoop and the guy was intoxicated and, and ill perhaps and didn't move. The sergeant poked him with a stick, hit him with his billy stick, moved him off the stoop and then looked at us and said, don't ever let anybody disrespect you when you are wearing the uniform. And I mean, it, it really starts from there and disrespect can be anything. Disrespect doesn't even have to mean stepping to someone. Disrespect can mean you're too sick or intoxicated to move when the person says move and they're hyped up, popped up on adrenaline or power or whatever the case may be. So like we're trained, like officers are trained to be dominant, to be aggressive. Like, and those are, yeah, we, yes. So that's very, 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 very real. Okay. So thank you, Courtney. That, that, that sheds so much light on a lot of things that you also kind of, and I know that we're just getting into vignettes and I just, I want to apologize in some ways that like this conversation has done a lot of kind of zigzagging. But in other ways, I really love that we're able to touch touch so many topics. Uh, but but Courtney, you've you've been so kind as to be vulnerable about you know the idea of I'm going to be the one to be the bringer of light to the community. I can do that that torchbearer feature. And I I I'm curious, you know, kind of as we get into that, this idea of of avoiding being the exception because I think that there's this idea in white space oftentimes that you know, if you're an art maker and you're a black art maker and you are held in high esteem in certain institutions, you know, you're the exception. You, you've done it right, you know, and we overlook systems of oppression that have barred other folks from being in the space that we've, you know, that we're standing in. So, so this is just an open conversation for anybody. It's not directed towards anyone specifically. What are, or, or, or I guess not what, how do we avoid the idea of being the exception, specifically within the world of black photography? Uh, I mean, how do, we, how do we show that we're not necessarily the quote unquote model minority? How do we push back against that? Um, I've, I've been, uh, I've been placed by someone in that context, you know, like being the, the, the person that was accepted or the token person, which, which I resent and I dispute because I feel that um, I, I stand on the merit of my work and I also stand on the shoulders of so many other talented black and African-American people before me. So to say that, um, I, I, I don't feel that way. I feel that the work that I do merits whatever rewards I get. And I feel that there were others and still today with me that are just as talented as me, you know? There are a lot of us out here. So I don't feel that I'm an exception or a token necessarily, you know, if that answers the question. Definitely, definitely. Anyone else? I think how we combat that is finding opportunities to uplift other people in our community, you know, and so maybe this goes back to Kennedy's comment about mentorship as well. I think we're all in, because we have to always acknowledge our own privilege, you know, and we all have privilege. And in whatever space you operate in, this is an opportunity for all of us to think about how we can change someone's life by providing opportunity or access to them in a way that might have been beneficial to all of us in our careers. You know, and so this could be um, scholarships, this could be mentorships, this could be any kind of apprenticeship model. You know, if there is someone who is in your community um, who is struggling and looks like you, and you know that they're struggling for similar reasons that you might have struggled with at some point in your past, this is a chance to uplift them and to help mold them or to, to give them an opportunity that um, might be able to create access for them in a way that you didn't have. You know, I think we have to 
uh, maybe this is mommy, right? Um, you have to learn um, and create the future that you want to see. That's, yeah. As a soon-to-be parent myself, since we have all these uh, just parented, just parent and soon-to-be's, you know, we're, we're trying to imagine a world that they don't have to, they, they know their power when they get here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that's, it's the most important thing. <laughs> I don't think there's a good word for just how important it is. Um, well, uh, all right. Can I just say one thing? Um, again, I'm way off the mark with, with a lot of the things that people are saying here, but uh, to distinguish yourself and not to be marginalized by, um, I have spent a lot of time investigating other cultures and we are, because we are who we are as a, as a people, we bring so much more to so many of these stories, so many of these narratives, so many of these stories, because we um, have had to, you know, our ancestors suffer and us be put over to the side, we bring so much to, so when I go to these other cultures, like I said, I, I made my sort of, bones in South America. I made my bones in Cuba and, and Haiti. And then I was able to go to places like uh, Japan and spent years and years and going and literally bringing so much and being told by them that I, that I dr addressed a lot of their issues so much better than my white counterparts. And I always attributed that to the fact that I was looking at cultures with a completely different eye. And I thought that that really had a, a, a major part of why. So you talk about how we can step away from being ex the different person or whatever it is. I think we bring so much more to so many of these issues even the white issues, we bring so much more to that. My clients will actually bring a perspective about adding other components to the photographs that allow them to be much more universal has made my career. And so I think that, you know, we should not even think about well, that's not true. We, we, because we are, are marginalized, we have to think about it. But we should think about that as a strength rather than a weakness. Well, and that's a, that's a perfect segue to the, the, one, the last, the, I'm going to ask two more questions, basically. This one being, do we believe, and not to celebrate white supremacy, not to celebrate systems of oppression um, or, patri uh, or, 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 or uh, paternalism or, or any of those things, but do we believe that there is something to be associated with uh, resilience, having experienced those moments, you know, you learn how to navigate things differently. Like what, what superpower have you developed because you've experienced white supremacy and you know, it's oppressive clinchings. Can I jump in on that one a look again? I'm sorry to go for it, go for it. Dominate, but you asked that question in the sort of preamble to this, uh, a few days ago. And I looked at it and, and a, a uh, very well-known photographer just wrote a book and one of the questions he asked was what is your as, well, as a photographer he had nothing to do with being black it was just what as a photographer what is your superpower and i i think it disappointed him although he said he liked the 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 essay i said my superpower is survival yeah. the fact that i've been you know i tell my students the only way you can be in business for three years is to be in business for two years. Mm -hmm. And that survival of doing this over and over, being able to be resilient, being able to, you, to use your word, resilient, to be able to understand the te technological exchanges, mm -hmm. to understand the, the context of everything that we're doing, to bring so much to do, 
the fact that being able to survive, the, the being a businessman, being a lawyer, being your own salesperson, right. being an artist, being a designer, being a negotiator, all of these things mm -hmm. have, you know, that survival mechanisms. You know, I'm a terrible writer, terrible writer. I had to learn to, I've written five, six, seven, eight books now. Mm -hmm. I had to learn as a survival mechanism to be able to do these things. And I'll cut off and let somebody else go. I like, uh, I, I like relationships. Uh, one of the things that I make certain of is that everyone that I photograph, I sort of share something about me that's personal, that's very similar to them and their particular situation. And I think that that carries me in a lot of communities uh, where, uh, you know, that, that, that I've been able, able to go. And I think the fact that I also continue to photograph people over long periods of time. And I think that that, that changes, uh, that changes how you view who you're photographing. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like that old adage, what is it, uh, walk a mile in someone else's shoe. You really get to understand something more about them. And it also conveys to them that they are more to you than simply a five minute interaction when you're simply taking a photograph, that you're interested in their life and that you're also willing to share something about your life, you know? And because I, I, I just don't think that we can get anything unless we share something. And I think that that's what photography is. I think that's the most important thing about photography is creating that relationship that sometimes can last a long time. I know we've got probably about five minutes left. Uh, Courtney, you, I saw your hand. I'll go quick. Yeah, I, because I, I think um, for me, I think my superpower is vulnerability. Um, Audre Lorde has said, um, nothing I know about myself can be used against me. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the truth um, because it's too easy. It's too, uh, I mean, I'm a black woman and now I'm an old black woman. So, you know, people have all kinds of judgments about who and what, who and what I am. And um, that's terrifying. So for me, it's easier to just go like, this who I am, I'll tell you who I am. You wanna know who I am? This is who I am and bring all of the crap. I'm profane. I've been very good today. You all haven't heard a single cuss word, but I'm a cusser. I'm very free with language and I, and I enjoy it and I appreciate it. Um, you know, I have, a, a, my father was incarcerated. I have like, you know, my parents weren't married when I was born, like all of those things. I'll tell you anything about myself because when I tell you, then I don't have to feel shame about it and I can do my business. I can do what I came here to do because I don't have time to be ashamed. So by making myself vulnerable, I, I don't have to be ashamed. And I think that that's my superpower. Mark? I think my superpower would be like empathy. Um, and it kind of echoes a lot of the sentiments that have been already said here, but you know, and empathy can come from a number of different angles. Like I can be angry because I don't see someone else showing empathy towards people that look like me, you know? Um, you know that though is like the, the baseline of what I consider to be my superpower and crux of my mission and my work is just to, to, to show the humanity that is in each of us individually. Um, you know, each person has their own individual stories and challenges that they overcame. Um, so, you know, to keep it pretty short, you know, empathy, I think, is one of the most important tools that we can use in art, whether it be, you know, for commercial purposes or for personal purposes. I think that, you know, empathy takes time. Empathy takes, you know, patience. And um, it also takes me to shut up and listen, um, to, to, to hand over the mic to someone else and, and let them um, tell their stories and explain to me how they feel. Um, that's the only way, you know, 
we can enact any real change is by on a on an individual basis of of humanity and support for each other. So empathy. Jessica. My superpower is that I can predict the future. <laughs> because I make it. Ooh. So I empower all of us, the 45 of us who are left on this call to think about how you can use your platform or your expertise or your experience to make the future that you'd like to see, because this is a superpower that we all have. I'm not unique in this. Kennedy. All right. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm trying to think of what my superpower would be. Um, I think trying, I think my superpower would be, I guess the ability to see beauty in a lot of things and not becoming a monolith and not, I think not being trapped in one subject matter if that makes sense being able to be attracted to a lot of things and just find a lot of things i don't know just alluring and wanting to capture it i think that's probably what mine is chandra i would think um endurance and persistence and and i'm i'm, I'm with lou a lot on you know just being able to have um, sustained a lot of stuff that we deal with as African-American photographers doing the work that we do. So I would say the ability to have the, the foresight and endurance to do the work. Keith? Um. I think my superpower is that being able to um, see things in light, in the best light, you know, um, that in the moment, in the blink of an eye, I can make something that's going to last forever in time and um, being fortunate to, um, to try to keep, you know, the light, keeping these eyes open, you know, and seeing things that, that to, um, hoping that my grandchildren be able to work and say, oh, this is what my papa created, you know, 50 years ago. So I'm just saying, that's my superpower, you know, being able to, to get behind those normally that I won't normally get, like to get in a maximum security prison with my wife and for us to document that and, and not being locked up in there, you know, where, right. so I think that's, that's fantastic. You all, I could not have asked for a better closer. Um, I'm just going to run the list real fast for those of you who are trying to catch it. That was survival, relationships, vulnerability, empathy, predict the future because you make it, see beauty in everything, and be non-monolithic, endurance, persistence, and then seeing things in the best light. And I really attribute that to just being grateful and having gratitude and hope. So... I have been so, I, I, I wish I could just transfer you, to you all the amount of love I have in my heart that you let me spend time with you today. Um, this is like a dream come true. I'm gonna be beaming like a little kid for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> so thank you for filling my cup today. Um, you've been tuning in. <laughs> you've gotten an opportunity to hear from eight of the most amazing, most prolific individuals uh, and that they all acknowledge that that is something that is available in everyone's heart. So that, that is very much available to everyone. Bryce, I'm going to turn it back over to you so you can do your sign off. <laughs> oh gosh, Michael, what a great job you just did. Um, thank you. It was and, a pleasure. All, all you guys on this panel, um, my mind is blown, uh, away by the journeys you guys have shared with us. Uh, those of you have been in this a long time, but I'm gonna steal Mark's phrase. I'm also just so amazed 
with the younger folks here, you know, Mark and Kennedy and Jessica, to steal your phrase, Mark, you've had a long career and a very short amount of time. I'm amazed at how much you three have, have, have experienced just in a very, very short time. And I look forward to, you know, seeing your journeys unfold, you know, as you continue. Um, you know, uh, Michael and I talked about, you know, how long the, this, we're only gonna cover a small amount of ground in even these two hours. Uh, I doubt any of us wants to stick around for another two, but we, we really could, you know, with the amount of ground to cover in this topic. And, you know, it's a shame it took this movement to try to make, um, you know, us move the needle in an institutional way. But what I'm really happy is that, you know, we can take this opportunity to, to shine a light on this. And I love that, you know, it's part of the mission of, of this festival, but that you guys here together is shining a light on this sense of community. And again, while we're waiting on the institutional needle to move, uh, how many times do you guys bring up mentorship? And I, 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 I'm looking at a panel right now of, of mentors for folks now and in the future. And uh, I'm just so grateful for you guys to have joined us today and do this. Um, as I've said, you know, we are recording this. Uh, it will be uh, posted in an archival way on YouTube. And hopefully we can, we can share the conversation that we've just had again and again, uh, at, you know, in the future. And uh, um, yeah, I, I will try to wrap it up, but I just, I, I'm so grateful for you guys and, and sharing everything you had to share today. And Michael, uh, amazing job pulling this together. Uh, that was so seamless and smooth. And the, your guys, the, the conversation was, was, exactly what we dreamed for right michael like yeah, it was exactly what we dreamed for i don't know if you can see what courtney is holding right now oh yeah <laughs> oh my gosh yeah um yeah i i bryce we're gonna have to do this again we're gonna have to do this oh again. we need to do it again we're gonna have to do this again and and we're gonna need to do this and just make it an ongoing series so that we can actually have more direct conversations with fewer people because you all have such a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience and i feel like we had, we didn't even get a chance to walk on the ice <laughs> no you're right well let's 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 make a date you know i love it we'll keep this conversation going and uh but i think two hours is pretty pretty fine and uh we're gonna we're gonna sign out out of here and love to you guys all that was that was brilliant thank you so much all thank right you. See you, everybody. Audience, thank you for being here. Bye, Facebook. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>